Lord, we invite your presence in this morning. We know in our minds that you are already here. We know that uh, you're omnipresent. Let us feel in our hearts that you're here this morning. We invite you into our minds, into our hearts, into this space that we occupy this morning, God. As we settle into this service, as we, um, as we offer you praise this morning, let the things that are uh, attached to us, the problems that we have on the job or the, the fusses that we have with family members on the way to church this morning, God, let those things fall, of, fall off of us right now, God, in the name of Jesus. Let them fall away, God. Let us focus all our attention on worshiping you. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning as we sing this hymn? I love this hymn. I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. And as I think of um, last week, we had our pastor from Japan here. Um, next week, I'll actually be in Africa, but I just, God's given me this picture of all of these nations, even now, are worshiping together. And through his mysteriousness, we get to tune into that song that is going across churches around the world right now, around this country. And even this, this song that's gone way before us and the song that will continue after we're here. And we get to join that song with our voices as we praise him, as we sing these very words. So join with us. All hail the power of Jesus' name. This next song, I could not get it out of my head. And it just says, Christ is risen from the grave. He's risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. He's alive. He's alive. And as we sing this song this morning, he has risen from the grave. We are worshiping the risen God this morning. So let's wake up and enter into that song. Let no one call his 
Good morning, everybody. Isn't it good to be in God's house? Walk across the aisle and meet somebody, somebody you haven't met before. If you want to eat them, just, uh, just invite them to lunch today. Find out their name. Wonderful. I hope you got a good invitation today to go out to eat after church. And uh, we'll try to get you out in time to, to beat all the other church folks to the restaurant. Because uh, that's pretty much a high priority. Wow. We'd like to invite all of our children now to go to the factory that are here. So we invite you to come and go ahead and make your way to the factory. Sometimes it takes them a minute to decide. There they go. All right. It's, I think it's important for all of us to know here that we have, I think it's seven services every Sunday. That's the conservative number. There may be more. And, and, and all day long, from early morning uh, Sunday all the way to the evening, there's services going on all over the campus for, uh, in, in different languages, for different reasons, different groups of folks. And, uh, and we, we have wonderful workers and volunteers that, that continue to watch out for children to make sure that things are put up and taken down. And, and it, it takes an enormous amount of folks to, uh, to see that the church has run well and all that. And so when you run into these folks, always be sure to thank them. Uh, every once in a while, a nice gift card to some restaurant is nice. And uh, if you want to give somebody an offering or something and bless them. Or, but just your words uh, are more important than anything. Thank you for serving. Many of our people have been serving for years and years and years. And without them, it would be impossible to do all that we do. Uh, I am going to, uh, let's see. No, I can't miss this. I do it sometime. If you're here for the very first time, I want to recognize you. If you're here for the first time, would you mind raising your hand so I can see where you are? All right, all right, very good. Keep your hands up because the ushers are coming, and they're going to give you a visitor's card. And if you'll fill that out, and then on your way out to my left, and it will be on your left when you turn around and face the doors, uh, there's a hospitality room back there to, to your left, right before you exit on this level. And there's coffee and pastries in there. Go in there, have a coffee on us. And if, if you're not new, you don't get free coffee unless you just don't have any money with you. And then we will trust you. It's a, but there is a, a, a donation suggested in there. So go ahead in there and avail yourself of, of that and, and meet folks that are here for the first time. It's a good place to meet some of our pastors and other leaders of the church, ask questions about the church, and to meet... Uh, to, to meet Adam and Carmen Malden that run our coffee ministry and are one of the great volunteers I've been talking about. I'm going to ask Chris Hollis to come at this time. We would like to announce who our new members are and recognize them. And so our deacons uh, process that. And so uh, Chris is going to tell you who they are. Hi, today we have nine new members from January. Tim Smith... Christopher Huffman, Teresa Edwards, Silvana Gravini, Ken Adcock, Trey and Rebecca Robinson, and then Christopher has someone he would also like to announce. I have a very, of course, all those other members are very special, and we're glad they're here. I have a special member to announce that's, that's near and dear to me. In the music department, we have, uh, I'm full-time, but also working with the music and with the choir uh, part-time is Beth Colwick, who directs the choir on Sunday mornings. Also, Jen Helvering, who, who leads us in worship. And we have a new member uh, who's come on staff with us part-time. His name is Phil Nitz. Phil, would you stand? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. This morning, Phil's singing in the choir, but you'll, you'll, have, you'll see him down here leading us in worship. You'll see him playing guitar. 
Um, we might find other instruments that he plays that we don't know about. But he's helping us with arranging and um, worship leading and, and all kinds of day-to-day stuff during the week uh, in the music department, and I'm really excited. If, you, if he looks familiar, Phil was in Voices of Lee for six and a half years, and he just graduated Lee University with his master's in church music. And so he's been here. He's part of the family already, but we're glad to have him. I would encourage you all, deacons and members of this church, please go up and meet them, introduce yourselves to them. And if you're interested in becoming a new member of Christ Church, you can go out to the hospitality room. There will be someone there that will answer any questions that you may have and have all the documentation that you may need to fill out for that. At this time, you know, last week Colleen had mentioned um, to everyone that we were going to be focusing this year on four service projects for the overall congregation of the church. And our first one is scheduled for next Sunday. We're going to partner with the Bridge Ministry, and they, they help minister to the homeless of Nashville. But I tell you what, let me just show you this short video, and then I'll talk more about it. underneath on this ledge, drinking, drugging, I guess you could say didn't really much care about nothing, 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 you know, really, nothing, life, life, life. Well, in 2004, I was suffering from depression and I had lost down to under 100 pounds. And an older gentleman told me that there were homeless people who were living uh, along the river here in Nashville, the Cumberland River. And little did I know that there are 11,000 homeless people on the streets of Nashville. I was so depressed and so thin that this, this gentleman, he said, can you cook? And I said, yes, sir, I can cook. I can cook jambalaya in any size pot. He said, well, make a jambalaya and meet me under the bridge. That was eight years ago and we're still there. I started out feeding about seven or eight guys out of the trunk of my car. And I found very grateful, very gracious people who came to be served that night. And I saw a way that I could help people in a tangible way. This is our life. Under bridge, we made our choices through life which is nobody else's fault. The next day I got up and I went shopping and I bought socks and toothbrushes and toothpaste and anything that I could get my hands on. And I became busy and motivated with real needs of real people. Well, to sustain life, you gotta eat. And on Tuesday nights, we heard about a church over here that we're feeding and it was called The Bridge. We could hear the music from over here. They had a ministry over there that fed, gave clothes, sanitary items, ministered, and great music. I would go to, go out there Tuesday nights and get prayer from the pastors, and that brought my hopes up. That faith just started growing me, and even though I still had the addiction. I, 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 it, was, it was a tough battle. Absolutely love being here. I, I don't know what to say. I have actually seen the Spirit of the Lord walk through these crowds. It just goes to show that, you know, when you do what God is calling you to, especially unto the least of these, you know, but for the grace of God, I can so easily be on the other side of this table. We feed people in... in many different ways. Of course, we serve a hot meal every Tuesday night. Sometimes we serve as little as two or three hundred people, and then as many as a thousand. 
Then after we serve the hot meal, then we unload the trucks and we load them down with non-perishable food items, as many groceries as they can carry off. I want to load them down with so many groceries that they have to bring their family members because we feed their spirit too. We preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because I believe that if I give them Jesus, then Jesus can stay in their hearts and change their situation. Well, now I've been sober four years and the bridge ministry, I mean, I go to their church. I'm working, I've had a steady job for three years. I mean, everything's coming together like what God's plan. I know I probably messed up his initial plan, but he always had a backup. <laughs> and I'm on that backup plan. We have a 20,000 square foot warehouse where we house all types of grocery items and clothing. We have refrigeration. We have everything from, from candy and sodas to spaghetti sauce and about 7,000 blankets right now getting ready for the colder weather. We have coats and great companies who are able to donate gifts and kind things that they have extra and so we have a capable crew who can load and unload the trucks and store and warehouse and distribute to the poor. The Lord has shown me that the need that they have is much greater than the need that they know that they have. They know they need food. I know they need Jesus. As, as I watched that the first time, um, there's been so many times that I've pulled up to someone, you know, on the corner of the street, and I've looked at them and I've said, I'm one choice away from possibly being where they are, or one tragic life event from being where they are. We don't know their circumstances. And I am so excited, though, that we as a church get to come together and help this ministry. So here's your opportunity. Next, next Sunday, February the 10th, you will have an opportunity to bring the items. There's going to be on the screen. They're going to show a list of items. They're also on the front of your bulletin. We need everybody to participate in this. And then after that, there will be tables. There will be tables set up in the atrium, in the, in the foyer, in the main atrium upstairs. And we will then take those items, and we'll go up to Montel Hardwick Hall, and we'll fellowship together. We'll package these items together and we will have lunch. There will be lunch served for everyone that's in attendance to that. But I encourage you to step out and help. And then even on Tuesday night, if you want to go down to the bridge ministry with us, we're setting up a group of people that will be going down and we need you to contact us. You'll have a chance to sign up on Sunday or you can email Amanda Beam and her email is on the bulletin that you all have. But again, I encourage you to participate. Let's, let's help this vital ministry serve the people of our community um, that are struggling at this time in their life. After first service, one of our deacons came up to myself, Pastor Dan and Colleen and told us that, that the gentleman, that the main character of this video, he had actually ministered to him about two years ago and then again a year later. And so, so we have an opportunity to serve these people and I ask you to get involved. Again, next week, next Sunday, please bring all your items. And if you'd like to sign up, please contact us. Thank you. Well, I like if, like if you've, um, if, if you uh, don't hear the message today because you zone out or whatever it is you do, remember this, what you just saw. Yeah. And remember this also, that if you've messed up what you think God's initial, initial plan is, God always got a backup plan. Get in on God's backup plan. We're gonna watch a, a, a video of announcements here, a very short one before we prepare for offering. I do wanna say though, you know, uh, we, we, we give uh, Chris a hard time because uh, if you're not used to being up in front of folks uh, like this, it takes a while. I get stage fright about every other time that I speak think I'm going to faint, get butterflies, do other, a lot of people do, some people may not. It's, it's, it, there's a lot of pressure uh, on that. And, uh, and so I really thank uh, Chris uh, and anyone that's willing, willing to serve us in this way, and especially Chris and Colleen. There's such, such wonderful helps in the church. 
they, they lead such a powerful and important part of ministry in our church. So make sure you say something to them, them about your appreciation for their work and get in on what they are leading us to do in caring for the folks in our city that need help. So thank God for that. Let's watch the screen. Good morning, my name is Christina, and here are just some of the events happening right here at Christ Church. This Tuesday is the February meeting of All Church Prayer. If you'd like to be prayed for or to pray with fellow congregant members for our pastor, staff, and church body, then this is the place for you. We'll be meeting in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. this Tuesday, February 5th. There is also a baptism class being offered monthly in order to cover the biblical significance of baptism, discuss frequently asked questions, and prepare candidates for baptism the following Sunday. Our next class is Wednesday, February 6th at 6.30 p.m. in Pastor Daniel's office, and our next Baptism Sunday is February 10th. One of our core mottos is, reach the nations here and abroad. Well, we have a short-term team going to Jamaica March 23rd through the 30th for evangelism and medical missions work. This team is mostly made up of members of the Christ Church Youth Group, and they have a table in the atrium where the team is offering bracelets and prayer magnets and accepting donations. Please stop by after the service to help these young people get to the missions field. And those are just some of the many great things happening right here at Christ Church. For more information on these events, check out the online calendar at ccnash.org or pick up a bulletin at any information desk. I used to call Christine our cyber friend, so my wife and I walked into a restaurant one day and there was Christine. And she said, oh, hey, Pastor Dan. She said, quit calling me cyber friend. She said, everybody at Christ Church sees me and says, you're the cyber friend. She said, I'm not a cyber friend. I'm just a person. So that was Christine, and she does exist uh, and gave us now the information we need in our ongoing church life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. You've been good to us. Thank you for the faithfulness of this people that give and give week after week. We pray, oh God, that we will distribute these funds with justice and integrity and they will go to keep the work of God going and blessing uh, the world in ways that we have just seen. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Would you sing that? Holy Spirit, thou art welcome. This is our prayer. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Amen. 
Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. full of mercy and grace. You have more power than anything else in the universe and you're full of mercy and grace. Thank you for allowing us to be in your presence this morning. We give you full control over our lives this morning. We give you full control over this service. Make us more like you.
Oh, come lay down the burdens. Oh, come lay down the burdens you have carried for in the sanctuary. One more time. for the reading of the word. Our scripture this morning comes from Luke 9, 28 through 36. Jesus climbed the mountain to pray, taking Peter, John, and James along. While he was in prayer, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became blinding white. At once, two men were talking with him. They turned out to be Moses and Elijah. And what a glorious appearance they made. They talked over his exodus, the one Jesus was about to complete in Jerusalem. Meanwhile, Peter and those who were with him were slumbered over in sleep. When they came to rubbing their eyes, they saw Jesus in his glory and the two men standing with him. When Moses and Elijah had left, Peter said to Jesus, Master, this is a great moment. Let's build three memorials, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He blurted this out without thinking. And while he was babbling on like this, a light, radiant cloud enveloped them. And as they found themselves buried in the cloud, they became deeply aware of God. Then there was a voice out of the cloud. This is my son, the chosen. Listen to him. When the sound of the voice died away, they saw Jesus there alone. They were speechless and they continued speechless and said not one thing to anyone during those days of what they had seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Thanks be to God. All too often I am like Peter who um, blurts out a lot of things really fast. and instead missed that moment where God just wanted them to experience his presence. And sometimes in my mind, I'm so internal, there's so much going on. And the beauty of sometimes these songs, these worship songs that we sing together, this next one just says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And as we sing these, sometimes it frees our minds up to just say, God, in this moment, I'm just going to be here with you. Nothing else. I'm just going to be here with you. And so as we sing this next song, this is a moment for you and the Lord to just enter into that cloud where all of a sudden they're aware of God. And may we be deeply aware of God this morning. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Sing this out.
Hallelujah. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. To reach out and touch Him. And say that we love Him. Open our ears. Lord, we thank you for this moment. We sing these words that the prophet Ezekiel and John the Revelator say that are sung continually in heaven through the ages of ages. And we join our voices with them, whether we are educated or uneducated, whether we are wealthy or poor, whether in would, we're in circumstances like this with a roof over our head or the people that are looking for food that we heard about today. All of us are in need of your grace, your mercy, and that begins with us being aware of your presence. We pray especially for those that are watching on the internet around the world right now and in months to come. We pray, oh God, that something that is occurring here in this moment will be of comfort and joy and strength to them as well. We ask in Jesus' name, all God's people said amen. You may be seated. Inquire if you want to slip out, you're welcome to. I, I, I don't know if they're staying or going. They do different things. But they work hard all Sunday. And last Sunday night, good heavens, I rarely heard you sing like that. I don't know how you sang again this week. You, this place was so just packed, packed, packed with people. Did an outstanding job. And we thank God for them. So, well, well deserved rest. Act sensible tonight as you watch that game. That's the only thing. That's the only, only word of caution I have uh, as they go. I want to talk to you about this, uh, about this story of the transfiguration that, uh, that Jen read to us. She read it from the message, which is uh, Eugene Peterson's uh, translation of the New Testament. And uh, I, I want to talk to you about it because we hardly know what to do with it. And I, I never knew what to do with this story. It's there. It's, you know, and, and uh, in some ages of Christian life, uh, this story has been talked about a lot, but it tends not to be uh, in our time. So I, I want to spend a little time on it. I learned about the transfiguration and what it was all about a few years ago, not, well, more than a few years ago, 1992. Uh, I was on staff here, and Pastor Hardwick uh, graciously uh, gave me leave to do, go do a summer program at Oxford University in Keble College. And what I was doing was an intensive uh, study of the works of C.S. Lewis uh, under the tutelage of some people that had studied with Lewis, uh, numbers of folks, and they had come from all different parts of the country and uh, 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 of the world. And this was a, such a, 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 a blessed time. It was two weeks, day and night, uh, in the middle of all of their studies of just all being together and just exhausted. I took notes that took me for years to uh, figure out and books to read and all of that, but it was just a wonderful time. And one of the people that most uh, impressed me was, uh, was a man by the name of Kilistos Ware. He is a, um, a scholar known more in the eastern part of the world than the west, but uh, he is an Orthodox bishop, as it turns out nowadays. Um, but uh, in those times, just a, a scholar, well-known and uh, you can read some of his works. It's very informative and, a, and a, a very kind man. I'd met him actually out on the streets at Oxford, walking around and, and uh, asked him if he might be a pastor, kind of had that look. Uh, and he said he was and asked where the church was. He was very kind, never told me you know, about his accomplishments or anything. So I was surprised when we were packed into this lecture hall, Oxford University, a place was just filled with people wanting to hear this, this great scholar, and in he walked, and it was the same guy that I'd talked to on the street a couple of days ago. 
But he got to the uh, podium and he began to talk about the transfiguration. He read the passage we've read here today. And I remember he asked us, he said, let's ask a quiz now about this story. He said, what glowed in the story? And everybody said, Jesus. He said, yes, Jesus glowed, but that's not surprising. Jesus always glows. What else glowed? Moses and Elijah, yes, he said. Old Testament saints, they were glowing too. Good, you were paying attention to be said. You know, they, they are holy people. They're transfigured in the presence of God. That's not so surprising either. What else glowed? And they're like, silence. And they're like, uh, what else glowed in the story? Silence. His clothes, he said. His clothes glowed. And I remember he said, matter matters. He said, God is after, through Jesus Christ, the redemption of every speck of, of dust in the universe. And he begins with the salvation, redemption of human beings. And he said, everything you are is to be redeemed. And everything you touch needs to be touched with the grace of God. And you're a steward of everything around you and your surroundings so that what God is doing with you, he wants to do with all that you touch. And I, I knew in that moment that the transfiguration was not just a bizarre kind of uh, 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 never to be repeated magic show. It was a glimpse into the heart of God. The work of redemption is much more than a get out of hell free card. God wants to transform us. He wants us to be different people. And not only that, he wants all that we touch to be different. And, uh, and as we become stewards and, and as, we, uh, as we begin to uh, enter into this work of redemption with the Lord, he transforms us in such a way that our entire life begins to reflect that. So, as we get into this story, we notice some things. One, we notice that uh, Luke deliberately tells us uh, in, in his selection of words that, that the disciples slept, but not an ordinary sleep, a different, an irresistible, very heavy sleep. And then he contrasts that later with them being awake. I don't know if you've ever slept, really slept, and you could not resist sleep. But I remember one time that I had uh, flown across the Atlantic, and I was in the hotel lobby, and it was like... 10 o'clock in the morning, maybe for them, but for me, it was, I don't know, whatever it was. I just knew that I was like, I, I, I don't know who I am. What was my name? You asked me, I don't know. Have you ever been that tired? I was that tired. And so they told me a room wouldn't be ready for several hours because it was early in the morning. And I'm like, yeah, it's early in last morning. You know, it's like, uh, I, I need a bed, but I didn't have a bed yet. So I sat down in the chair and I thought, well, I guess I'll just sit here. Boom. I was gone. A couple hours later, I woke up and I had, I was sprawled all over there. And, and the, you know, I know that wasn't a very pretty sight, and, uh, but it was irresistible. A heavy sleep had come up on me. And that's what happened to the disciples. And it came on them as they began to watch Jesus pray. And Jesus began to glow and his, uh, and his clothes glowed. They, they saw that and then they were out. They were conked out. And only later they came to, as we'll see in just a moment. Now, what this made me think of, and I talked to you about this a few weeks ago, but when I was in, uh, when I was in a graduate school, I did some classes on medical hypnosis, and it, it, it just amazed me. And what we use that for is when people can't take uh, anesthesia or whatever, then they can be kind of talked down from their anxiety. That they can experience less pain. It's a very useful kind of thing. And, and uh, so when we were learning uh, uh, about this, uh, they were teaching us how to observe people's level of conscious awareness. Because every day, as it turns out, we're going in and out of trance. Now, you don't know that, but I'm going to prove it to you in just a little bit, and you'll know that it's so. No, I'm not going to hypnotize you. I'm just going to tell you uh, so you can notice it yourself. Um, I, if I did that, I wouldn't have a, a job anymore, so I'm not going to do that. And maybe go to jail or something. 
But every day we go through very, very kind of cycles of awareness and stages of awareness. And, uh, and as I begin to watch and realize that, that uh, when, uh, when you have these skills that it's not so difficult uh, to lead people into trance because they're already in trance anyway. And I began to have a question that began to bubble up from just the bottom of my heart and has been there ever since and I want to pass it on to you. And the question is, are any of us ever awake? Are we awake? The issue is not are we tranced out, but are we awake? And what does it mean to awake? And I begin to realize that some people have been in trance for years their entire life, in fact, and there would be many, many people who would never be awake their entire life. They would sleepwalk all the way through life. Unforgiveness is a trance. That's when you are constantly playing old tapes of things people have said, things people have done. We all go there. When we're hurt by somebody, we can't hardly escape from that loop and we get in there and we remember and we think and, and it becomes a part of our conversation. We're going round and round and round and we get captured. And if we get captured too deeply with that, we can't do anything else in life because that's our entire world. We're in a trance, and the only way to get out of that trance is to forgive because the people don't know that they're in your head, you know, uh, and that they're, you're making them say things in their head that they don't recall saying, and, and they don't know that. That's a, something that's inside your own head. Addiction is a trance. It's a set of programmed actions, and there's a trigger, and when the trigger happens, then we go into programmed behavior. This happens, so we go here, we go there, we go the other, and then after, uh, after a while, when all the steps are completed, people wake up, and they're, uh, they're amazed at themselves. They're upset with themselves. They, they, they don't know why they did what they did, and they realize they're out of control. That's why in the 12 steps, they, they start out with, I found out that I was powerless over my addiction. They are captured by a certain kind of program that's triggered and then bang, every time they fall into that pattern, they're under a trance and they can't wake up. Trance is acting mindlessly without intentional, deliberate consciousness. What trance looks like is like the zombie, you know, uh, Bugs Bunny, as I recall, uh, uh, one time hypnotized Elmer Fudd. And you could tell because Elmer Fudd was, you know, his eyes were big and, and uh, he was a zombie, so that's easy to tell. But workaholism is also a trance. And that means you, you do this, you do that, you do the other, you do the other. And the next day you do this, you do that, you do the other. And the next day you do it again. And the next day you do it again. And if this is your life and you're constantly going round and round and round and going through all these steps and you're doing over and over and over and you, you never kind of break the routine, how do you even know you're here? You say, well, that doesn't happen to me. Oh, yes, it does. I'm going to show you right now that it does. Do you realize, I mean, if you can ever think about a time you've been driving and you've been driving maybe alone, and then you realize that for the last 20 minutes, you weren't there. You were somewhere else. How did I get here? What? The sign says what? Nashville, 15 miles. Up the last, last sign I saw was like 80 miles. Where did I go? Anybody ever have that experience? Most of us have. Some of us haven't. Your mother-in-law doesn't. She tells you, just stay awake. Open up. You know, there you see that car. What's wrong with you? So that, that, she's saving your life. You know, get, thank her for it. But we, we do these things without awareness. It's like these programs, like brushing your teeth. Have you ever one day, like, I don't know if I brush my teeth or not. You got to get up, uh, 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 rub your teeth with your tongue to see if you brushed your teeth. Because a long time ago, this was a conscious habit. But now you're, it's a program habit and you don't know. You're just like picking up the brush. You're thinking about things, you're brushing your teeth, you're combing your hair like, and you don't, you don't know if you've done it or not do it. You've got, and that's, for me, I, I have a... a you know, there is a medication I must take. And so uh, I, I found myself every day saying, did I take it? Did I not take it? Did I take it? Did I not take it? Did I like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, I'll take two to make up for it. Like, well, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, so you got, that's why, that's why as you, you know, you, uh, I, I start to say as you get older, but really I'd recommend this to everybody that ever goes into a trance that you need a little pill box that says Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Friday. and when it's done, you got to refill it and start all over again. It works. You know what I'm talking about? Well, the ultimate, the ultimate addiction, the ultimate trance is sin. 
We can't break out of it. We, we, can't, we can't break out of it. We fail to see the grace and the goodness and the glory of God because we're too captured by the spirit of the age. We're like the old fairy stories, you know, where the wicked wizard has everybody under a spell. Some are frozen like zombies and some are working feverishly, but nobody is thinking, nobody is aware, nobody has original thought, nobody knows who they are. They are what Paul says, in bondage to sin. They are slaves to sin. They're bondage to evil. They're not thinking their own thoughts. They don't even know if they're here. And the question is, how will we ever wake up? The Bible urges, throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament urges sobriety as though sobriety is not a normal state and sobriety is not a normal state. The normal state of human awareness is flightiness and irresolution and rapid loss of attention and boredom with details and being impatient with anything that requires long fixed attention. Eastern religions call this monkey mind. Monkey mind, because a monkey, you know, monkey is swinging, and he lets go of one branch, and he flies through the air and gets another branch, and then he flies through the air and gets another branch, and that's the way our minds work. So often, in our normal state, that's not sobriety. It's about not having control. One thought leads to another. And you see, uh, many of you are like, what did he say? What did he say about monkeys? Because you're somewhere else. You've, 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 uh, what I said a while ago reminded you of your brother-in-law, and your brother-in-law said that two years ago. And what did he think? He, I, I, mean, I can't. He just. Uh, I got to see him again next week. He's like he drives me crazy. And I also got that bill to pay tomorrow. And I like it. Like it. Woo, swing and oh, swing and oh, swing. So every once in a while, like, well, they're all laughing. Why are they laughing? Why are they laughing? Why are they laughing? What they say? You missed it. You're here, but you're not here. Your body is here, but you're somewhere else. You're driving to San Francisco. You don't know where you're at. <laughs> Monkey mind. And that's, that's, that's why the TV advertisers, which are the best hypnotists in the world, they know exactly what they're doing. That's why the TV advertisers have to be shorter and more color and action and skin. Oh, somebody's naked. What are they selling? Uh, deodorant. Well, I like that deodorant. You know, uh, <laughs> I'll get that one next time. And so you're watching, and then there's, there's a song, la, 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 dee, 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 and something's playing, and you can't get the loop out of your head, la, la, and, and you're, you're, you're just entranced. And so now, now you've, are there any Coke in the house? You know, some of you going to do that tonight. And it's like, some of you going to do that tonight because it's like you're spending millions and millions of dollars masterminded powerfully intelligent people are getting into your head with some jingle or some horse or something and you're going to find yourself buying things you never thought you would buy. Yeah. Because in that time they've got your attention, you're in a trance and, and there is a post-hypnotic suggestion that says buy this or do that. Monkey mind! And monkey mind is why we can't have conversation anymore around a television, a computer, or a phone because the sounds on these devices have us hypnotized. They control us. We must answer them. Somebody not here takes precedent over somebody that is here. And the ding dong, ding bong, bog, bog, playing on the stuff got our attention. We got to answer it. It won't shut up. And we got to answer it. No matter what you say, what you say, I can't remember what you were saying. And so we've been going through this for many, many years and we've troubled by it and finally we've given up having conversation altogether. We don't have conversations anymore because I don't know what you said two or three minutes ago and how that connects with what you're saying now. What'd you say? <laughs> unable to follow an argument, unable to stay attuned to a voice, we can't remember comments made a while back and how it fits and that's like sermons got to keep getting shorter and shorter. We got to do things to keep people's attention, to keep them wake up because they're not listening. <laughs> Monkey mind. We will not hear from God until the spell is broken. Who's got us under the spell? It's the God of the age. It's, it's the times. It's the jingles. It's the rumors. It's the stuff. We keep repeating what we've heard, cliches, rumors, bits and pieces of disconnected information we're sleepwalking through life. C.S. Lewis says in the last line of his, of his probably best book, most acclaimed book, how can we meet God face to face until we have faces? 
Most of us are family fragments. We're bits and pieces of a community that we've grown up with. We have a hard time thinking original thoughts. We don't know if we have an original opinion. We may be very passionate about our opinions, but when we stop to think about it, it's grandpa's opinion, dad's opinion, uncle's opinion, preacher's opinion. We've never wrestled to decide who we are, what we're about, what, what, what life's about to us. We've just been following some kind of script that comes from somewhere. When will we wake up? Salvation is an awakening. Verse 32, when the disciples had fully awakened, they saw the glory of Jesus and then they saw the two Old Testament saints with Jesus. That's pretty cool stuff. What would we see and know if we would only wake up? Constant, constant kinds of tests around the world has proven what I'm about to say to you, as bizarre as it, it may sound at first. What we see and what we do not see is culturally conditioned. Our culture and our language determines to a great extent things we notice and things we do not. You show people in, in uh, primitive Stone Age kinds of conditions of photographs, uh, photograph, and they will not always immediately know what it is, even if it's a, a person standing in front of them that's on the picture. And they will not recognize always at first. That, that, that can get it pretty quickly because, of course, the human mind that way. But we do not understand that a two-dimensional photograph is an abstraction, and it is something you must learn to read. It's not a given We've learned to do that in our culture, but other cultures have not. But there's many things, if you're walking through the jungle, you don't, you, there's many things that the, that the people will see and know all around you that you won't know. You won't hear the chirps and what they mean. You won't know that suddenly it's too silent, which means there's a predator nearby. You won't know that, that, uh, that, that the sky is given a kind of a hue that means that we better find shelter in a, a little while. You won't know all of that because you're not, you haven't learned to read the signs. And, and, and what, what, what is shown here in the transfiguration is they saw what ha is always is. If our faith is correct, then this place is filled with supernatural beings, angels, demonic presence, all kinds of supernatural beings. And, and there's forces in here that we know nothing about, we cannot see, unless God takes us there to see them. And when we do see them, it's called a conversion. I don't think that it's probably right to say when we're born again, when we confess Christ as Savior, that that's the moment of conversion. Conversion is when we start seeing things God's way. It happened, there is a, a story, you know, in the Old Testament about uh, uh, Elisha and Gehazi. Uh, Gehazi. Gehazi is the servant of Elisha. And so the, the Syrian army surrounding these two men and, and Gehazi said, oh, all is lost. Look, they've got chariots, they've got horses, they've got, they've got swords and all of this. We're undone. Nothing we can do about it. We're overcome. And Elisha said, Lord, open up the eyes of my servant. And suddenly he saw the air filled with angelic hosts of, of, of uh, warriors that were uh, protecting them. And when he saw that, he was comforted. But God had to open his eyes. Here's what we need to notice about these disciples. They had just left their old life. They didn't know that yet. They would soon be preaching and writing the Bible and healing the sick, but they were still unskilled in spiritual life. And, and we know that because Peter, you know, he's, he's such a character. He, he's, he's just babbling on and on as, uh, as Eugene Peterson has it in the message. But uh, in, the, in the King James, he was, he was spoke it without thinking. He just like, oh, I know. This is really great. This is cool. We're going to build three churches here. We'll have a church for Jesus, a church for Moses, and a church for Elijah. It'll be really super and blah, 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 blah. He's just going on. He didn't know. But he was, he was, uh, he was wanting to express what he was feeling. He was like, I, I'm in a new place. I'm doing something new. I'm taking baby steps and I... I, I'm aware, I'm aware. Now, the others were more cautious, and they didn't make a mistake. But also, they were not the ones to whom Jesus said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. Yes, he was speaking mindlessly, but he was speaking. You see, coming to a spiritual experience, coming to a spiritual awareness is more like falling in love than doing your income tax. It's more like watching the, you know what y'all going to do with that game tonight, some of you? You're going to be a few of you in a room. You've been watching people on the screen and they're taking stuff across the field and they're talking to, and you're going to be yelling and you're going to jump. Ah, ah. You'll be all excited. You'll be saying things. They can't hear you. 
You know, like, get the bogus. They're not hearing you. They cannot hear you. It's not two-way communication. If they could hear you, they wouldn't listen to you. They wouldn't care what you're saying, but you're all caught up. You're like, you got you to express yourself. And some of you, if that was happening in this church, you wouldn't come back again because you'd say our church is crazy. It's okay for you to do it there. It's not okay for you to do it. Now, can, you, can somebody explain that to me? Why the rules there in your living room are different than the rules in here? And if somebody gets excited and said, Jesus has saved my soul, you're like, whoa, whoa. Well, they do that just showing out. But in your living room, you will scream and yell at that football. And it is like, what's the deal with that? But being, being spiritually adventuresome is not just always about being loud, you know. That, that's another thing to learn because that's the Mary and Martha story here in this passage we've been reading about. Mary and Martha, uh, they were sisters and Jesus was at their home and Mary was talking to Jesus and Martha was, you know, uh, busy doing stuff. So Martha gets ticked off and she's like, my sister, lazy bum, sitting there, won't do and won't help me, blah, 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 blah. So when we look at that, when you say, okay, Mary is listening, listening, and she seems immobile. Martha seems to be running around and doing a lot of work. So Martha must be the one that's awake. No, Martha's asleep. Mary's awake. It's not about just action. Appearances can be deceiving. If you think about that, somebody sitting and thinking about things looks lifeless, lifeless looks bored. You may be bored with them. And a chicken with its head just uh, recently cut off is very active, but the chicken is dead. <laughs> Appearances can be deceiving, and in spiritual life it can be a deceiving. Everybody that's saying hallelujah, thank you, Lord, and ooh, 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 is, many times they don't have any more spiritual life than anybody else. They're just kind of excited, and it's okay to be excited. It has nothing to do. The, the action and, and motion is not connected to anything except it's just expressing something, and we don't know what's going on there, and we don't have the right to judge that. But sometimes a person that's sitting, taking it all in, thinking about it, is coming to an important decision, and they're becoming spiritually awake. Anyway, Peter is babbling on and on. That's his personality. And the Bible says, as he was speaking, they entered the cloud. This is awfully important. King James says they were afraid when they entered the cloud. And I, I, it made me think, there was an old English saint that wrote a book. You can get it online. It's easy to read. It's fairly short, called The Cloud of Unknowing. The cloud of unknowing is where you're undone. You're deconstructed. Here's the thing. These young Jewish men, they knew who they were and what they were about. They had their opinions. I'm sure, you know, they were fishermen. They had really strong opinions. They, were, they, knew, you know, they knew what they were about. They knew what they were going to do. They, had, they just had it all figured out, life all figured out. And now they can't see. Their landmarks are all gone. They're in the cloud. If you want to grow in God, you will enter this, crowd, this cloud sooner or later. And that's where you learn the world is not as it appears. And to get to the truth, you've got to pass through the surface appearances. And it can be very, very scary when everything is all removed. Some of us have come from very strong denominations to where everything was, was planned out for us. And every, our thoughts were planned out and, and we, our heads were full of cliches. And we knew exactly how to think and how to express ourselves and how to, and so forth. And then when we're out of that, suddenly it's like, I don't know what, all the, everything's gone. I, you're, you're, you're in the cloud of unknowing. And, and it can feel like you're going backwards, but it's not. You're going forwards because for the first time in your life, you got to decide who you are and what you're about and what your relationship with God is. Now, it is a dangerous time. I met a, a man one time, professional situation that I was in with him. Uh, he, uh, he, he, he was a very intelligent man, known for his intellect, as a matter of fact, and uh, very, uh, very educated and he was unstable. When I met him, he was nearly uh, completely un mentally unstable. And the reason is that uh, just for fun, he had gone to a kind of a seance sort of thing. And he had experienced some spiritual things in a way that just completely unnerved him and, and uh, 
uh, made him look at life very differently because he had been an agnostic and didn't really believe in spiritual forces and suddenly he had had experiences with things that just had completely unnerved him. He was in the cloud of unknowing, but Jesus wasn't there with him. You don't want to go in the cloud of unknowing without Jesus. But in this cloud of unknowing, what occurs is a worldview shift. And in that, if our culture molds what we see and do not see, then what that means is that when you become a believer, when you really are, are sold out to God and, you, and you're following Him, then you've got to wrestle with what does the Bible mean. Now, the difference between a liberal Christian in America and a conservative one is a liberal believes that signs and wonders and angels and demons and all that never did exist. It was a way that primitive people expressed themselves. A conservative believer doesn't believe that, believes that there were spiritual beings, there are spiritual beings, and these things really did happen, they just don't happen anymore. And that's, that's as dishonest as it can be. Because if it didn't happen then, if it, if it did happen then, it's going to happen now. And if it's not happening now, it didn't happen then. If, there were, if there's not any angels right now and nobody's ever seen an angel today, no one ever did see an angel. If God, can't speak in, if God can't speak in a dream to somebody today, he never did. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's untenable to say that it happened then but doesn't happen anymore. I mean, the Holy Spirit is not a retired author. He didn't say, well, I finished with the book, so I don't have to do this stuff anymore. <laughs> if there is a God and he's concerned about you and he's leading your life, he can speak to you today. Amen. And you can know him today. But to get there, you may have to go through some circumstances to where you are undone and your old world kind of falls apart for a while and you're suddenly relying on Jesus when you're having to pray in the food and when you're having to pray in the money. And this is what happens around the world when believers are, are worried and they've, and they've got persecution going or they've got some deprivation of some kind of, of food or water, shelter or whatever and they've got to pray this stuff in. They get really attuned to God and they know, they know that God is speaking and they can tell you things and and they live in a different world than we do now how do we get there in our world many times it's through struggle and and challenges that you don't have an answer for and your psychiatrist can't figure it out and your sociologist can't figure it out and your doctor can't figure it out when all that happens and you've come to the end you've got to enter this cloud and you've got to talk to God and you've got to say give me new eyes like Gehazi did, had so that I can see the glory of God and I can be led by God Well, um, here's the last point. And it's that transformed people re-enter life. Now, there's some religions and some Christians even think this, that if you're really holy, you don't mix and mingle with anybody else. You just kind of glow, you know, in the dark and, and you just dispense blessing from afar. <laughs> and your holiness is just so much... Uh, you don't want to contaminate it, so you got to be, you know, all by yourself somewhere. And most of the time, you're right. That's what we wish you to do. <laughs> um, but, you know, when you have a genuine experience with God, uh, it, it is unnerving. If, if you've ever had a really powerful spiritual experience, you don't want to leave it. You want to stay right there, and you don't want to, you don't want to leave it. So it's very important to know the last thing that happened here is they came off the mountain and went on with life. Jesus glowed, of course. He's the son of God, and he's talking to Moses and Elijah. That's pretty cool. If that happens today, there could be a lot of tweets. <laughs> and you can tweet. If Moses and Elijah appears here, by all means, tell everybody you want to. It'd be great. Because I won't be able to tweet. I'll be kind of passed out. I'll be in, gone. Uh, so some of you might think it's cool. But when it's all over, you see, you, you, you've, you've got to reenter life. There's a story, uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas, which is a, a, a great writer in the 1200s, one of the most brilliant people that ever lived, very powerfully influential in, in world uh, thought. Um, he, he had an experience with God, uh, and the secretary that was with him said, that a, a light began to come from his body and claimed that he actually was lifted off of the ground. 
And what we do know from Aquinas' writings is that, is that he wept for days and he couldn't think. He, and he said, I'm not writing anymore about theology because it's all straw. He said, it's all straw. I've seen the glory of God and it's all straw. That was his famous phrase. And so the church authorities uh, told him, yeah, take some rest and then go back to writing. And they were right. We tend to think, no, why, should, why should they say that? He should just kind of stay and bask in the glory. No, not until he goes to heaven he shouldn't. God didn't make us to be angels. We're embodied human beings and we're here appointed by God to follow God and through us for God to show his glory to others. And so the thing is, Candy here was on the screen today as she's talking about, you know, she got in a place where she's depressed and she's lost all this weight and she doesn't know what to do and she's, she's just anxious and all of a sudden this is, this is the great remedy uh, for uh, us when we are undone and we've come to the end of one era and we don't know what comes next. She saw a need and instead of continuing to moan about her own need, she began to move to, to uh, meet somebody else's need. And that was the place where God met her in a powerful way. And I tell you, there's not a pastor in this city that's doing more of the work of God than Candy's doing that she talked about on the screen today. Our faith is not constant flights of glory. And holiness is not being lifted above everybody else. Being in the presence of God is about receiving power and instruction from God to serve him in a real world. The disciples came down and Jesus and the disciples suffered and they ate and slept and they got older and they died. Spiritual life doesn't deliver us from mortality. It just makes us look at mortality in a different light. And here's the conclusion. Um, if you have any interest in knowing how I think and what I think about life and the world, I couldn't suggest a better way to you to figure that out than, than to read the little book that I wrote a few years ago called Faith to Faith. And I poured my, my heart into that book. And it's a, it's a little thumbnail sketch each chapter about one of the world religions. And most of the characters I made up uh, as kind of ways to tell the story uh, to keep people's attention. And then I respond to how Christianity agrees or disagrees with each, each of these religions. One of, the, one of the chapters I most enjoyed uh, writing was the chapter on Buddhism. And, uh, and in it, I mention a man who, um, who was a real live man. I didn't make him up. His name was Callaway. And he wrote a book many years ago called Zen Way, Jesus Way. And it's his testimony. And this is where I want to stop today. Callaway is interesting. He's an American. And he went to Japan and he began to study Zen uh, Buddhism with, with a, a spiritual master by the name of Suzuki, very famous uh, uh, Zen teacher. And uh, for 20 years, uh, he didn't go to church. He, he, he thought of himself as kind of a Christian, but Zen Buddhism was the way that he was going to express his spirituality, as he put it. And so he, he continues to go into more and more meditation and he, and he goes from a stage of, uh, to stage of Buddhism and learning more and more until finally he knew very much indeed about, about Zen. And one day he said that, uh, that uh, Mr. Suzuki told him, uh, you need to go away now and you need to think through. You've, you've come to th about everything that I can teach you and you need to decide uh, what spiritual path you're going to walk. You can't hold on to these two paths. And that offended him because like, well, why can't I? And he began to think it through. And the way he thought it through was he compared the symbol of Buddhism with the symbol of Christianity, the lotus and the cross. The lotus is a beautiful white flower. It's a symbol of Buddhism because it, it, it can, it can uh, uh, thrive in any kind of uh, wretched atmosphere. It, 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 it can grow in trash and, and the nasty places, uh, and, uh, but it's always pristine and beautiful. White uh, has a fragrance. It's, 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 it's just a beautiful thing. And it, and it speaks uh, to the second of the four great uh, principles of Buddhism about detachment. It's, it's a way that, that spiritual journey is about detaching yourself from life which is suffering. 
And then he began to look at the uh, symbol of, of the cross. Most of us wear crosses from time to time. We have crosses on our walls. I've got a little uh, cross ring, and some of you have cross necklaces and things. That's not what he's talking about. These are beautiful, and they're crafted, and they're, and they're fine. He's talking about the old rugged cross, misshapen piece of wood on which uh, human blood, excrement, all kind of nasty stuff is splattered because of the torturous things that occur on a cross. And it is the symbol not of detachment, but of utter abandonment to and involvement in at the, at, the, at the cost of great suffering to the one that involves themselves. And he said he decided that that was the real picture of holiness, not detachment, but involvement. And when one involves himself with the wretchedness of the world, one will face temptation one will face cl times of clouds of unknowing. There'll be time that you will hit the wall. This is not the pristine Christian path that shines and, and is glorified. This is the way Jesus meant when he said, if any man be my disciple, let him take up his cross and follow me. It's a path that Candy is walking. Now, everybody's not called to do ministry to homeless. We're all called to care about that and to help that. But each of us, God has something for each of us to involve ourselves in. We will not, we will not be Christ-like by detaching ourselves from all the structures of things that challenge us or make us wobbly in our faith. Holiness is not isolation, it's insulation. And we've got to learn what, what our orientation is if our, if our heart is fixed upon God and we want to serve Him and love Him. We will come out of the cloud. We will have our experiences to where we sense His presence very deep and it's beautiful and it's wonderful and we're surrounded by all the brothers and sisters in Christ. And then there will be periods in our life, sometimes those periods can last a long time, where we come off the mountain and we join the struggles of humanity but with a new knowledge and a new awareness of God at work in the world. I'm going to ask if our pastors and, and uh, people that are ordained ministers in the church and deacons, would you stand just for a moment? I want people to see where you're at. Will you just stand? Now, the reason that I'm... Uh, these folks don't glow in the dark. <laughs> um, but I want you to... I, I want you to know who they are because after this service, some of you may want to go to them and say, I've got something I've got to talk to. I've got a prayer need. I've got some, a concern about the church. And I want you to know who they are. And having seen them, I wonder if everybody would stand. And if there's anybody here that you'd like to stand with me just in the closing moments of this service and say, man, something has pierced me through as you've been talking, and I want to experience God today, and I'm willing to walk with Him, even if it's in the cloud of unknowing, would you stand with me here today? In the cross in the cross be my glory ever till my rapture so shall find rest be on the river. Anyone else? In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever. Till shall find rest beyond the river. I'm sorry I've been a little long-winded today, but I want you to know if you felt a drawing from God to be here, the Lord wants to speak to you before you leave. 
the world that we are in has so many questions. And there's really one, only one of two ways that we can tell them that Jesus is alive. If there are signs and wonders that God does that they know are not manipulated, that are not fraudulent, that awakens their heart to God, they will know that God is present in our life and in the world. And the other way, the only other way that I know is if our lives are so utterly transformed, even if we're not perfect, which we will not be, if people can see that there's been great progress in our life and we've been transformed in God. Other than that, we have no basis to speak to the watching world about the claims of Christ being risen from the dead or about anything the Bible has to say. Those are the only two bases two bases that we have to teach others about Jesus Christ. And so this is a very crucial thing that we're asking the Lord that He would teach us, however graduate is, that step by step we are following Him hearing the call of the kingdom, entering into his glory, being transformed by his presence so that we are reflecting his presence in the midst of a broken and troubled world. Lord, thank you, especially, Lord, for these that have come forward. There must be some real compelling reason that they would want to be here to the front. And I know there must be many, many other people that might have wanted to come but didn't want to come up to the front but they want to meet you. And I pray, oh God, that something that has been said or done in this service today will deepen our desire for our minds and hearts to pierce more deeply behind the appearance of things and enter into the reality of things. And Lord, that even if we don't get all the answers and we won't get them all, we will be able to say, I have met him face to face. And we will be your reflected glory in a broken world. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for this, your people. Keep them, watch over them through this week. Grow us in you, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, God bless you. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Have a wonderful day.